do to Judges and chapter 14. Judges in chapter 14. <clears throat> Judges chapter 14. I'll read the whole chapter with you. Verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Then Samson, or sorry, then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother. And he gave them, and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So his father went down unto the woman, and Samson made there a feast, for so used the young men to do. And it came to pass that, or when they saw him, that they brought thirty companions to be with him. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If ye can certainly declare it me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. But... If ye cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me thirty sheets and thirty change of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. And he said unto them, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is, is it not so? And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother. Shall I tell it thee? And she wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her, because she lay sore upon him. And she told the riddle to the children of her people. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And he said unto them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he went down to Ashkelon and slew thirty men of them. And took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend. You could keep reading, but I hardly want to. May God bless to us what we've read already. <clears throat> On Monday, we considered poison in Philistia. We're going place to place with Samson. We're on a bit of a tour guide. I, I'm kind of curious, you know, every day where Perth goes. And so I ask, nobody knows until the last minute. And so I don't know. I just think that's a bit of a mystery. And, I, and you love going here and you love going there. And everything's just, and we're, we're going on a tour though. Or we're going on a tour with Samson, place to place. There was poison in Philistia. What was needed was a separated consecrated, sanctified man. That's what we need. That's what God knew that they needed. And so he sends Samson in to be a Nazarite. We considered a bit more of that yesterday when in Zorah, where his parents lived, we saw a zeal in Zorah. 
So the poison in Philistia was met by the zeal of the Lord and the zeal of the woman and the zeal of the man. And then we see a man now full of the Holy Spirit beginning to move. Well, today I'm calling it teasing in Timnath. Teasing in Timnath. We're going to have a riddle or two. We're going to have a bit of jesting, a bit of joking. We're going to have, we're going to have uh, some cover-up operations. We're, we're, going to, we're going to see a little bit a man who has a vow. If I had a subtitle with this, I would call it flirting with fire. Because he's going to just start to play. You know, some people play church. Some people play church. They take that which is holy and good. And they just dumb it all down to all they're doing is playing church. Well, we might just take a look and see what consequences can result when we begin to, uh, we begin to flirt with fire. We begin to walk on the edge. We begin to just have riddles, teasing in Timnath. Now, you recall the complex character of Samson. I told you at the beginning, sometimes he's so spiritual, he's like a picture of the Lord Jesus. In fact, in fact, I'm going to see him like the picture of, of the Lord Jesus right in this chapter. And then he so carnally causes us to blush. And so he's meant to be separated. So are we. We're not to become like the world to try to attract them. We're to show that we've got something totally different so that they can see that where they are in their sins and where they are in all of their things and their wickedness, and that, that they're to see that we are different because we have something. We've got eternal life. And so while we are friendly and while we would mix and rub shoulders and we do have to go to feasts, 1 Corinthians 10 says, and you'd be disposed to go. There's weddings to go to. There's funerals to go to. There's various functions you have to go to with your work and such. But what we want to remember is that Samson was mighty and strong and filled with the Holy Spirit whenever he was recognizing his vow. I like the fact that there's seven times mentioned in this book, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord. Othniel linked with him as the spirit of the Lord. Gideon, Jephthah. Those are three times the spirit of the Lord comes upon them and is working. And with Samson, there's four more, four more. I find that in, uh, most instructive that we have the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Well, Samson's going to play with that fire. There's a verse in the Bible that we should remember. It's in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 27 and 28. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? I know that's only a proverb, but it helps us to realize that when we begin to flirt with fire, when we begin to disregard the sanctified life that we're meant to live, when we begin to set aside the word of God and its demands, and yes, yes, this is an extreme lifestyle. People talk about the extreme sports. and, and extreme. I tell you, if you want to get your heart raised, try taking a suitcase full of tracts and Bibles into a country where you're not allowed. My heart never went below 120 for about three months. I thought it was great. I was on an eternal high. I don't think my wife could stand me, but anyway, we'll just leave that. I tell you, if you want an extreme sport, I met a couple. I thought they were great. We met them in China, actually. And, uh, and, I, and we were just, we were there for a few months to, um, to do some things. And so while we were there, we met this other couple, and I, I thought it was marvelous. Do you know how they met as teenagers? She had a knapsack full of Bibles. And she was taking it in from Hong Kong into mainland China. I'm going back a long years, a lot of years now. And she was smuggling it in and she was so tired. She couldn't get the backpack on after she had stopped at the top. And out of the shadows, a big American fellow steps and says, let me help you. 
He had a backpack full of Bibles too. And he, he's, he puts the backpack on her and there they walk together and they're still walking together. Oh, nothing like meeting your spouse when smuggling Bibles. Oh, nothing like it. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure there was tingling sensations for sure. And wondering if you're going to be shot dead. I tell you this, if you want extreme sports, sorry, if you want to live life where you feel that there's a great deal of, of uh, energy and you live like a Christian in a wicked world, I tell you, uh, that's a way to get the heart going. Well, I want you to notice, first of all, just before we, I'm going to, I'm just going to divide this chapter up into four ways. I'm going to consider the, I was going to say the lady, but in this country, I can say the lass, can't I? Alas, the lass. So we've got the lady. And then I want you to consider the lads. I don't know if you use that expression around here, but uh, we, there's people are running around Balamina. They consider themselves to be the lads. So we'll consider the lady. We'll consider the lads. Then we'll consider the lame. And then we'll consider the lion. So that will just keep me in order to consider these various things from here. But before I do that, I want you to notice that there's an expression in this chapter. It's called father and mother. And would you believe it? It occurs seven times. Father and mother. Father and mother. And we learned that with the zeal in Zora, that a spiritual home in enemy territory was just the very cradle for the man who was going to help deliver the people of God. The influence of this man's parents is phenomenal. So you can see it there in verse, in verse two. And told, uh, he came up and told his father and mother. Verse three, and his father and his mother. Verse four, and his father and his mother. And verse five, verse six, verse nine, verse 16, father and mother. You say, this is a great home. You know, it was great to see the father and mother were in it together. You didn't have the mother. You know, after he comes and tells his father and his mother, you didn't have a, a, a like a Rebecca sneaking around the corner saying, come on, son, I'll, I know your father's a bit of a fuddy-duddy, and I know your father, he's got a bit of extreme views, and you undermine. You know, I know mothers that undermine the leadership of the father. So the children mock the father in his so-called godliness, and it's because of the mother, and they're not united together. That's a shame. I'm, so, I'm quite confident I'm looking at couples here, and you would actually be laboring together. And sometimes it takes a bit of work, doesn't it? <laughs> Could you imagine being married to me? Like that would be hard work. And so you've got to work together. And the father and the mother were working together in that home. And you see them together, 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 together. You say it's a godly home. Uh, uh, you would say with parents like that, the children will turn out marvelous. Can I just speak to, I have no idea of my audience right now. But can I just speak to parents? who did their very best and raised their children in the fear of God. And all you can say is, our children took a pathway down. They went down. That's because that child did have his own free will. That girl did have her own will. And I actually know girls that deliberately went out and to embarrass their father and to really get him looking bad in the papers, they went out and deliberately were caught shoplifting and they did it. And they stood there as the police were interviewing and the father was called and she looked at him and grinned. Gotcha, dad. This'll be in the papers now. You know how it is. Elder of the local assembly's daughter caught for shoplifting. Oh, that would look good in the headlines, wouldn't it? I tell you, there are some bad girls. You know that? There are some bad girls. And there are probably a whole lot more bad boys. And they had godly parents. So that's a good reminder to all of us. This chapter is saturated with a godly couple who did their very best. Listen to them. Listen to them. Let's consider this lady, shall we? Let's consider the lady. Samson's gone down to Timnath. What does he see? He saw a woman in Timnath. And what does he tell them? I have seen a woman in Timnath. And in verse 7, he says, she pleased Samson well. Well, it didn't last very long because in verse 17, she was sore upon him. So things, things just got a little bit rocky. But at the beginning, you know, things at the beginning can look just so good. 
so good. This, this woman, we're not exactly described. We don't have her described to us, but clearly she, um, she knew how to talk. She knew how to please Samson well. She appealed to the man, whether it was in her looks or whether it was in her, in her nice gestures or whether it was in the way she, she was able to, you know, she made him feel good. Oh, there's nothing like a woman to make a man feel good. Oh, he felt so good about her. And so he says, well, she pleased him well. And the parents sensibly recognize that a man, it's perfectly natural for a man to marry a woman. Perfectly natural. And so they didn't say, oh, no, 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 you don't look at girls. Daddy, girls are bad. You don't do that. You just live with your mommy and your daddy forever. And we'll take good care of you. They weren't silly. They recognize the course of nature is such that there will be an attraction. I state carefully, there will be an attraction between a man and a woman. Do I need to say any more? That's a perfectly natural and a God-given attraction that a man would desire a woman and a woman would be attractive and attracted to a man. And now there is God's way. And so they recognize that. And they, they didn't say, you can't have a, have a wife. They said, look, have a wife, but make sure she's of the daughters of thy brethren. Make sure she's among our people. Why are you going to the Philistines? So this will just helpfully bring me into a topic that everybody knows, but just allow me to state it again. It says in 2 Corinthians in chapter 6, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So that would mean that it was actually wrong for him. And the parents called the Philistines what they were. They didn't have a mark upon them that signaled that they were in a covenant relationship with Jehovah. These were the ones, these uncircumcised Philistines. They were not following Jehovah. They were not devoted to Jehovah. Samson, would you wake up? If you take up with that girl there, you're going to have a life that will be out of fellowship with God. You're going to be led down the wrong ways. You're not going to be able to marry in the Lord. There's a good expression. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39 is a little expression about a woman that if her husband dies, she can remarry. And then it just adds, in the Lord. In the Lord. That's a lovely expression. Children are to obey their parents in the Lord. The wives are to submit themselves unto their own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So that's a qualification. That is a restriction. Definitely is a restriction. If a husband's asking his wife to do something that isn't according to Scripture, well, that's not in the Lord. The Lord's not going to bless that. So think of the expression in the Lord as recognizing that there is the Lord, first of all, in all of his commands. And we are to submit to authority, but it's in the Lord. We are wives submit to husbands in the Lord. Children submit to their obey your parents in the Lord. A woman is to be married in the Lord. A man's to be married in the Lord. So the Lord is the one who governs all the relationships. And these parents, these godly parents are saying, yes, it's good to have a wife, but in the Lord. And so I am becoming dismayed whenever I would see believers that would actually be going on well. And then they become attracted to an unbeliever. Now, actually, from a natural point of view, one can almost understand that. There might be a beauty. There might be a very kindness uh, uh, of something. Or there might be something that just fits in well with your personality and that. And, and you, would, you would get along very well with them. And there might be that natural attraction. But remember, spiritual things always overrule the natural. So it is natural to want to be married, but you're to marry in the Lord. You are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. In other words, do not marry when you have the choice. You would feel very sorry in some cultures where some girls don't have any choice and they are married off and they have no choice. So we're respecting that. But where you have a choice 
And I think as far as I know, arranged marriages are not a big thing in Scotland. I mean, half the older sisters are working on it, but we'll, um, and, but we're not, I won't go any further on that. And, uh, and the, interestingly enough, arranged marriages have a better success rate than when we choose our own spouse. So maybe older people actually know something. They know a whole lot. They know about compatibility and such. I'll leave all of that because here in Scotland, it's the land of the brave and the land of the free. And you can go and you can just marry whoever you want. No, you can't. You can't marry whoever you want. It has to be in the Lord. Now I'll just step one further. What is courtship? Well, courtship is that time in our society where you uh, spend time together before you're married. You don't have the privileges of marriage, but you do get to know one another. So if you're not to marry an unbeliever, don't court one. Don't date one. Is that another word? Do we still use that in 2022? I have no way. You know, I, that's a trouble. I'm getting so old. I don't know all the buzzwords, right? I, apparently on invitations now to weddings, they'll say plus one. I said, plus one? What's plus one? Well, apparently if you're single, you get to bring your escort. So I guess all the boys will take their mother or something. I don't know what they do. But uh, so don't marry an unbeliever. That is actually just, that's a red line. Okay. Draw the red line. Draw the red line. If you want to have a home for God, don't marry an unbeliever. So don't court an unbeliever. Don't date an unbeliever. Of course, there are friends that you would have. We have them all over the place. There's a huge difference between being friendly to a girl and dating a girl. I don't need to be any more explicit than that. Huge difference. So guard your heart, young brother. Oh, you say, there's not enough believers to go around. I'm never going to be married. Hmm. I know a young brother and he actually wasn't very marriageable. Do you know what I mean by that? He, he, he was an interesting fellow. And at the tent meetings in Vancouver, he, uh, he decided to pour his heart into those tent meetings. And he was there when the chairs needed moved. He was there. The hymn books needed given out. He was there and he worked and he worked and he worked. <laughs> and a girl came in off the street and she got trusted Christ. Well, wasn't that good? He's married with three children and about five grandchildren today and so on and everything. And the brethren just looked at him and said, well, there you are. The Lord, you, you just labored on for the Lord, you restricted yourself to believers only. And none of the girls would look at him. But the girl that came in and got saved was a perfect match to him. I'm not telling you what will happen and not happen at your next gospel meeting. So please don't attend gospel meetings, hoping that it's a marriage making maneuver. But I am saying this, there's still a God in, in heaven. And you draw the red lines and say, Lord, I'd like to be married, but I'm only going to marry in the Lord. Look what Samson did. He's flirting with an unscriptural relationship. He went down. He went down. Well, let's look at the lads. Now, what is he doing? What's really in his heart when he's talking to these lads, these 30 young men? What's he really saying when he gives them a riddle? He's now, with the woman, he's flirting with an unscriptural relationship. Now he's jesting with unsavory companions. He's, uh, he's making riddles. You know why? Because he's proud. He's got everything under control. How many times have I heard a young man say, I can handle it? I can handle it. I'm not sure that you should be, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says evil companions corrupt good manners or bad company ruins good morals, says one translation. And you come alongside and say, listen, listen, young fellow here. Uh, do you know these companions that you're running with? Don't worry. I can handle it. How many times have I heard that? There's a bit of an arrogance. There's a bit of a swagger. 
I, I don't I don't know, maybe in Scotland, you don't have this, but over there in North America, uh, fellows, they get to a certain, you know, especially P7, I think it is, they develop a wee swagger before they go to big school, in which case they run around like little mice for a little while. And then they get to upper six or whatever, and they've got the swagger back. And there's just this, this arrogance, this, it's not scriptural, it's not spiritual. But here he is, Samson, he's beginning to jest with these companions. And uh, I tell you, he's going to be corrupted, going to be corrupted. I'll get back to it in a moment, but you see what he's making riddles of. He's actually going to make a riddle of something where he had a spiritual victory. He's on slippery slope here, isn't he? He slew a lion with the spirit of the Lord. We'll get to that at the end, but he slew a lion with the spirit power of the spirit of the Lord. And he makes a riddle out of it. You know, that's what the, that's what the world will do. It'll make you so that you're joking in the way you shouldn't You're You're making light of your spiritual precious pearls that you would have as a believer. And instead of, instead of living a holy consecrated life, you're, you're busy jesting and joking. And uh, yeah, you soon learn. You soon learn the lads here aren't really your friends. Their loyalty is to themselves, isn't even to them, isn't even to their own people. They end up burning. A, if we went into chapter 15, they end up burning the woman and her, and her father anyway. Listen, the world is just a cesspool of joking, evil companions. Don't run down the lane with them. Don't be jesting with them. Just be aware. Be aware. Get your head screwed on right. Adjust your mind and your, adjust your thinking. So am I speaking to any young man here and you're running with the lads? Is it helping you spiritually? Your friends at school, we all had them. Do they helping you spiritually? Helping you to be a good, godly Christian? Or have they introduced you to your first beer? Have they introduced you to your first glimpse of pornography? Have they introduced you to all sorts of books and magazines that you never thought possible? I know hardly anyone reads anymore. Have they introduced you to screenshots, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, or even this very old thing that only grandmothers look at, Facebook, whatever it is. Have they introduced you to all of those things? I'm not a fool. And I said it to my own boys, as I've said it to you now, just now. I know what the lads at school are like. And the girls are quickly behind them. And all that's being traded back and forth is doing you no good. Do you know what you might have to do? You might have to get up and walk away. The first look identifies what it is. The second look is lust. Do you follow me? Do I need to be any more explicit? This world is a cesspool. And it's ruining Christian testimonies of old men as well as young. And young sisters, I speak to you too. Watch out for the lads. Actually, it did take the spirit of the Lord in verse 19 to actually deal with these lads in a way and to get shut of them and to get out of the, to get it all. The spirit of the Lord, thankfully, delivered them from the lads. If I could put it that way, he had to go down and get the, and he slew 30 men and got their, the sheets and the, and the garments and he brought back and he gave it to them. And that was it. That was done. He was done with the lads. So the spirit of the Lord can help you. Brother, sister, the spirit of the Lord is able to help you. Cry to him. Ask him to help you. And he will help you. There is victory. You don't have to go down the lane with the lads. You don't have to go down those pathways. You can stand up and cry to God. And God will give you the victory. And I say that with confidence. Not because any victories we claim for ourselves, but we give God the credit for delivering us time and time again. And you learn to trust God. I don't, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. You can have a personal relationship where the spirit of God delivers you from this present evil age and learn to trust the spirit's power 
and say, Lord, deliver me again. And he does. Remarkable ways. <laughs> Remarkable ways. There are, well, maybe we should go to the lane. We had the last unscriptural relationship. He's flirting with her, then jesting with unsavory compassions. Now he's dallying along unseemly pathways. Five times it says he went down. Look at verse one. Samson went down to Timnath. Verse five. Then went Samson down with his father and mother to Timnath. Verse seven. He went down. Verse 10. So his father went down unto the woman. He's causing others to go down now. And then in verse 19, you have there that he went down to Ashkelon. Down, 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 down. That's not the Christian pathway, is it? He's dallying along this pathway that is, well, what did, you know what it did? It, it was the road to compromise. What's he going to compromise? His vow. Did you notice that he wasn't allowed to touch anything as a Nazarite? Did we not get that the other day? Not even a grape. Not even a raisin. Nothing. Aye. So what's he doing now? What's in verse 5? What describes Timnath? What's the one characteristic of Timnath? It says to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. This pathway is a pathway to compromise. This pathway is taking him to a place where everything exists that he's not allowed to touch. Now, if I could just stop there for a moment, would I be correct in saying that there are some streets that you shouldn't go down? There are some lanes that you shouldn't be going on. There are certain places, whether it is virtual or real, that you're not to be dilly-dallying around. Look, you'll not be tempted if you don't swipe, you'll not be tempted if you don't travel past all those disreputable establishments, especially you find them in large cities. Two young men came to visit us in Tokyo. They didn't come to visit us, but we visited with them because they were just out to see the world. And they were Christians. And so I just said to them, just as they were leaving our house in Tokyo for the head came for a bite of lunch. I said, now, listen, lads, I just want to say a couple of things to you. Number one, never open a closed door in Japan. By that, I mean, do not go into any of these places that will be bright lights at night. They look like they're a simple cafe, a sushi place. They look, don't go into them. Behind that closed door is absolute iniquity. And I said this, in Tokyo, there's 30 million people and no one will ever see you. There's no accountability. You'll not be running into one of the brethren. You guard yourself. Don't go down any of these lanes in Shinjuku or Shibukawa or just don't do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how it is. Because I said, no one will ever know where you are. So you have to guard yourself. <laughs> you would never believe it. Two days later, I'm in Shinjuku, where 19 train lines converge and 2 million people go through a day. And the big, long train carriage is about 8 to 10 cars. And each car can hold 200 people. And each car has four doors on it. And I'm standing there on platform whatever on the Yamanote line. And the doors open right in front of me. And there's the two fellows standing right there. I said, well, maybe there is accountability. The Lord knows all about you, bro brethren. And off I went. And I, I'd never seen such white-faced two young men. Are you, you, you following us? I said, I hadn't a clue where you were. The Lord knew. I'm just saying that to just give you an example that you need to guard yourself. Don't go down certain lanes. It's the road to compromise. He was going to end up marrying an unbeliever. He was going to end up having an unclean carcass that he was going to be touching. And sadly, he took his father down the same pathway. I want you to notice that it was a road to conflict. It was a road to conflict. Now, I do know that the Lord was, was in it all and was looking for an occasion to get the fight started between Philistines and, and Samson. I do know that. 
but I just want to apply it in this way. It was a road to conflict. It was a conflict. He was going to meet the devil in the form of a lion. He's going to meet devilish people, these lads. It's going to end very, very badly, all because he went down a lane that he shouldn't have. And I just find it so sad. And I've sat down with people as you have too. And I've looked at a young man straight in the eye, maybe a middle-aged man, and say, where did it all go wrong? Where did it all go wrong? He says it was the perfect storm. I said, yes, but where was the first step? Thinking of another assembly where 12 young men on the same morning were excommunicated from the assembly. Same morning, same assembly, 12 young men. I knew them. And I sat with one of them later and said, where did it all go wrong? Well, he says, it started by us listening. I'm going back a ways. This is before internet. Started by us listening to the radio after 12 o'clock. And then we started visiting certain places in the town. And then every one of us fell into immorality. I just thought to myself, the time to stop is before you start. The time to stop is before you start. Samson, at the end of the lane, there's vineyards. On the lane's the devil. Samson, there's unsavory companions. Samson! Wake up. Do I need to say wake up to someone here? Do you need to change a few things? Some relationship? I tell you, it's hard. I think one of the hardest things one of us ever had to do was at a university after sitting with some, beside someone for probably a number of months was to come into class the next day and not sit beside them again. The professor comes in and says, what are you sitting over there for? Your seat's here. I said, no, sir, I'm sitting here. Do you need to do that? You say, I can't do it. You better. Look at the lion. Look at the lion. We've talked about the last, the lads, the lane. Now he's playing with unclean powers. When you start down a road of compromise, when you start jesting with the lads, when you're starting to be attracted to the lady that's in an unscriptural relationship, if you ever go near her, you know you're playing with unclean powers. I want you to just notice something, though. He did actually get the victory. He did actually get the victory. I want you to notice three things. Because he devalued the victory. He didn't have a true estimation of a true, victorious, triumphant spiritual life. He got a victory through the Spirit. It says, the Spirit of the Lord, verse 6, came mightily upon him, and he ripped him as he would have rent a kid. And with this lion roaring against him, you can imagine, he's no match for the devil, a lion. He's no match for the one roaring against him. But he just rips him apart as if he's a little goat. He had nothing in his hand. You know, it just reminds me of Christ. Christ in his triumph at the cross. Oh, you see, he's looking like the Lord Jesus here, isn't he? And there he is at the cross, the Savior at the cross, strong bulls of Bashan. And you've got the, they gaped upon me with their mouths. You've got the lion and it, everything is against Christ at the cross. What a triumph. What a triumph was Christ at the cross. What a triumph was Samson with this lion when filled with the Holy Spirit. But here's what amazes me, and yet it doesn't amaze me because I find things in my own heart that match it. He devalued the victory over the devil, and he deluded himself regarding the damsel. I can handle the lion. I can handle her. Really? Samson, how did you handle the lion? Was it in your natural strength? It says the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Why is it if we just get an ounce of spiritual pride 
that we delude ourselves into thinking we can handle pretty well everything. Is there anyone here thinking that you've accomplished things quite nicely spiritually? I don't think you older brothers and sisters whom I revere in the Lord greatly would mind me saying, is it only young men and young women that go astray? Is it only them? Watch, just watch for that spiritual pride that blinds you from seeing things the way you ought to. Watch for that arrogance that comes in. I think it was my brother, Gene Higgins. That would be Sandy Higgins' brother. And as much as you enjoy Sandy's teaching, you should hear Gene Higgins' gospel preaching. And I enjoy him. He says to me, he says to me as a, as a veteran evangelist to a younger man, he says, you watch, you watch yourself carefully when there's two things in your life, spiritual success and physical exhaustion. He says, you watch when those, and he says, if you've had a good series of meetings and the Lord has drawn very near, he says, you watch yourself. I'll tell you when the hardest week of my life is. It's, a, it's the week following a series of meetings where God is drawn near. So I think you older brethren and sisters, you know that. And you're not going to be spiritually arrogant. You see him, he devalued that victory over the devil and deluded himself concerning handling the woman. The spirit gave the victory, but then he goes back to that place of victory and he defiles himself with the carcass. Do you remember that other part of the vow? It wasn't to do with the vineyards, it was to do with dead things. And he actually defiles himself. I take it he did. I know the preachers are great at imitating, and I'm not a drama, a drama sort of a person like some of the older preachers. They were great. And they had, they, had, uh, they had Samson, you know, reaching into the carcass as carefully as he could, and then trying to get out the, get out the honey. And he'd say, oh, I did it. I did it. I got the honey out without touching the carcass. Well, why didn't he tell his father then? I take it he went to the carcass. I take it he was defiled. He devalued the victory and defiled himself later. So he deluded himself regarding the damsel. And he defiled himself at the very point of the spiritual victory. He actually compromised his vow. These things are lessons to me. I almost feel embarrassed. Because we need to be ever so careful that at the point when God draws the nearest, you be very, very careful to make sure you've recognized the spirit of the Lord did it. And you just keep in that place. The next thing is he got something natural. He got a natural sweetness out of a spiritual victory. You would know honey's never part of any offering. And the natural does not overcome the spiritual foe. And he used the spiritual victory later even as a, as a riddle. Do you know what he did? By devaluing the victory, he defrauded himself of spiritual apprehension. He made something that was spiritual into a natural. You can almost hear the gospel preacher now bragging. Oh, 17 souls. Great meetings. You know, you should have heard me. Oh, I tell you, I could preach. You ever hear that kind of arrogance? Of course not. No gospel preacher would ever talk like that or ever exaggerate or ever speak. No, no one would ever want that. There, there's, there's, there's no one that would talk. About, you know, I talked to these people. I witnessed to these people. And, and they came to my door and I managed to get them with this argument. And I got them with that argument. I don't know about you, but I've been absolutely destroyed by J.W. standing at my door. To the point where I began to doubt the Trinity until I had to get myself away and went and talked with some spiritual brethren and say, could, could, could you help me? Is there really the Trinity? I know you're all thinking that I'm basically a, uh, I, I was a bit younger than I am now at that time. But I tell you, what a wake up call. And by the way, she was an old granny. She absolutely slew me with her arguments and with everything. Well, uh, I think we need to recognize, we need to recognize these things are spiritual. 
And there's a battle that's spiritual. And we don't brag about the victories. We just recognize the spirit of the Lord is in it. So don't defile yourself, even at the point of the victory. And don't defraud yourself of the spiritual benefit by bragging about it and making it into a, a source of pride, a natural sweetness, if you will. Oh, Samson, you ruined everything. You were on the wrong lane with the wrong lads going for the wrong lass. And you met by a lion and God, by his grace, gave you a victory and you still kept on going. Don't delude yourself, brother. Don't defile yourself. And don't defraud yourself of the spiritual apprehension. Oh, God did it. So that's why when you've had your greatest spiritual victory, you get home and down beside that chair or that bed or that place where you go to meet with the Lord. And you get down and you thank him and ask him to put a hedge about you and to preserve you so that you won't be defiled. Well, the spirit overcame the world and the devil. The spirit's able to overcome the flesh. I tell you, we are deeply dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And when the spirit of God was mighty in Samson's life, he should have stopped and thanked God. So I'm going to conclude my remarks. I know I'm a few minutes early today, but we're dealing with heavier subjects. And I'm going to stop the remarks and I'm just going to say now, you pray for me. I've given this ministry now, so do you think it won't be tested? So you pray for me. You younger people, you pray for your elders. You pray for the older people. You older people, mark out the young men and the young women, and you pray for them. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. And it causes me to tremble when I know something of the flesh that drives me right through spiritual victories until we want the flesh to be fulfilled. Oh, Samson, it ended up in flames. Actually, you never hear of his father and mother anymore either. Well, you pray for me. I'll pray for you. But never forget. There is victory. There is power. And we'll help one another so we can overcome the flesh. We'll help one another. Please, brethren, help one another. Sisters, help one another. We're in this together. But the victory belongs to the Lord. So let's not be attracted, flirting with unscriptural relationships. Let's not be jesting with unsavory companions. Let's not be dilly-dallying along compromising lanes. And let's give the credit to the Holy Spirit when the victory comes. May God bless his word. Let us pray.